from the entertainment capital of the world, Las Vegas. I'm your host, Christopher Calloway, for Creator Talks, the interview show for comic book aficionados. Today, I welcome back to the show, Hornsack Pinchetchote, the award-winning author of Infidel, published through Image Comics. Hornsack's sophomore comic effort is The Good Asian, a nine-part series being published through Image Comics as well. The creative team includes interior art by Alexander Tefenki, color by Lee Lowridge, letters by Jeff Powell. The first issue of this comic series goes on sale May 5th. The Good Asian is an Asian noir mystery set in 1936 Chinatown, featuring Edison Hark as a Chinese-American detective from Hawaii and the first generation of Chinese-Americans to come of age under an immigration ban. Pornsack and I discuss the real-life influence behind the character Edison Hark, the Hawaiian detective Chang Apana, who himself influenced the silver screen portrayal of Charlie Chan. Today, Charlie Chan movies are considered racist because of its stereotyping of Asians. I asked Pornsack about the current cancel culture and its impact on certain books and movies. Should Charlie Chan movies or any racist material be erased from history? We discuss important background events, including the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 and processing of Chinese immigrants through San Francisco's Angel Island. And how did these give rise to Paper Sons? As we conclude our interview, I ask Pornsack about his guilty pleasure, a missed opportunity, and when he took a risk. The answers will surprise and delight you. So please join me in welcoming my returning guest, Hornsack Pinchachote, the award-winning author whose first comic effort was Infidel, now returning with The Good Asian, which may be the beginning of a new Asian noir genre. Here now on Creator Talks. Hornsack, welcome back to Creator Talks. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be back. Last time you were here... You were just starting Infidel with Aaron Campbell. Yes. And since that time, it has been named as one of NPR's 100 favorite horror stories of all time. NPR. That was pretty cool. And it was even placed in development for a movie, TriStar. Have you heard anything about it since then? They renewed the option through the quarantine, and they have new writers on it. And I don't remember those writers' names, but I know that they're new writers. Uh, when it's time for them to show me things, I will pay attention. Until then, I was just like, okay, cool. They have the option. They've secured it. Now it's a matter of timing. And I know right now is not the best time to say, let's make a movie and get into the theaters as fast as possible. At least it's renewed. That's good news. And that was your last comic. And since then, besides what we're going to talk about today, how have you managed to keep busy with your other work? It's basically a lot of juggling. After Infidel, there was sort of a burst of television work that kind of happened. And so I did a bunch of that stuff. I wrote a couple of shows, Marvel's Cloak and Dagger being one of them, uh, Light as a Feather, Two Sentence Horror Stories. I'm working on another one now for HBO Max that I'm actually not sure if I can talk about. So, I, <laughs> so I'm going to go with not talking about it. Uh, and then working on like some comic short stories here and there. But mostly I've been concentrating on The Good Asian. The original goal was to try to get it out last year, but I think a lot of plans kind of fell apart last year for many people. And so now it's coming out May of this year. What's great is that because of that, we are very far ahead in terms of our deadlines, and it's really given me a really good chance to kind of see the whole story and as the pieces kind of come in. So it all kind of ended up working out at the end. Well, I'm glad you're back with new work, new comic work. Thank you. And when I saw what it was, the last one, the horror story was great. That was Thank you. very creepy. So I know the bar is high. The Good Asian, it's a crime mystery set 1936 Chinatown, told from the perspective of the self-loathing Chinese-American detective Edison Hark. Yes. He's a Chinese-American detective hailing from Hawaii, which at the time was the only place you could have uh, Chinese detectives. America didn't have its first Asian-American detective until 1956, 1957 in California. The thing that I was always drawn to was that, because I watched this when I was a kid, in the 1930s, there was this whole boom of sort of Asian crime solvers. Charlie Chan was like the most famous. Mr. Moto and Mr. Wong kind of came in to try to get some of that audience. But it was interesting to me that uh, during this time where in the 1930s, where there was such so much popularity for Asian crime solvers, there were actually no Asians in the police except sort of in Hawaii. So I thought, why not take what we know now about racial history, 
for me, it, a big thing that factors into the book is the Chinese Exclusion Act, which prohibited uh, the Chinese from entering America from 1882 to 1943. And after that was the Immigration Act of 1924, which prohibited uh, certain Asians and Arabs from entering the country. And so I like the idea of taking this archetype of the Asian crime solver and sort of telling that story while acknowledging sort of America's sort of racial history when it comes to all that stuff in the 1930s. And that's kind of where the idea of the book came from. You know, I haven't seen a Charlie Chan movie since I was a kid. I have very little recollection of it. Only, <laughs> the, the only thing I can really remember about Charlie Chan was Charlie Chan and the Chan Clan, the cartoon. Wow, <laughs> if yeah, you think back, in the 80s, right? It was 1972. Oh, wow. Yeah, oh, wow. one season. It didn't last very long. I don't remember much about that either, other than the kids being a lot more hip with it, you know, kind yeah. of regular kids. And he's kind of the honorable father, very yeah. traditional Asian, and they were more Americanized and working with pop. <laughs> right, right, right. Totally, totally. <laughs> but those movies, those Charlie Chan movies, and you're addressing a lot of the racism in this book also. Some of it's considered now racist because of the way Asians are portrayed. Yeah. And because you had a, a white actor. His name was uh, Warner Oland. Oland, yeah. Warner Oland played it for a very long time. And another movie I saw him in, I didn't realize it was him until I saw the credits. The Werewolf of London. Oh, that's right. That's he right. He was one yep, of the yep, werewolves. Yep. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Totally, <laughs> totally. The thing I find most interesting, and honestly, this might have been one of the things that partially inspired the story, was that way before I had the idea, I would have Asian American writer friends who didn't know of Charlie Chan. And I thought that was kind of so amazing. And I think it's because that, in retrospect, it was sort of found sort of offensive, especially with sort of a white actor playing Chinese, that they kind of all disappeared. I always thought that was kind of a shame in just the fact that it is part of history. And so I think the fact that it was forgotten, I think, made it more attractive to me to kind of reinterpret. With the current cancel culture movement, do you think Charlie Chan films would be targeted next? And the second part is, and this is important, is the phrase cancel culture itself a biased description of what it actually is? So I, and this might be slightly controversial, I don't know if I believe in cancel culture. I believe in consequence culture. Mm -hmm. And I believe that things happen and there's consequence to every action that we have. Yeah. And so to that fact, if we're going by sort of canceled, are the Charlie Chan movies already canceled? Like I said, I don't see them anywhere. I have many Asian American friends who sort of have never seen them. And to me, that is the stories and the entertainment that we consume. It's pop culture and we grow in and out of pop culture all the time. You know, so the Dr. Seuss thing was interesting to me because from what I understand of it, the state chose not to put out these six books. So there was no one coming at them saying you can't. That was an interesting thing to me because if I don't want to do something, then I just don't want to do something. I don't put it out. I'm not canceling myself. So that was an interesting story that kind of went in its own direction. But that's kind of how I look at it, though, is that there are consequences. And the good news about that, then, is that there is a business incentive to not be an asshole. There is a business incentive to not be insensitive. And I would argue that the people who are trying to sort of work with sensitivity and occasionally make mistakes they're given chances to correct themselves. You know, I think it's more a problem when people sort of, you know, dig their heels in the sand and, and whatnot. At least that's how it looks to me. It's a tricky question and something I'm definitely sort of, I think we're all kind of feeling it out as we go in terms of what is the right amount of sensitivity to show, what is the wrong amount of sensitivity to show. But I kind of think things that are the result of insensitivity, well, there's a consequence to be paid for that now. I don't think that's a bad thing. No, I agree. I just hate to see things completely erased. I do agree with you on that. I'm a very big believer of, I like everything to have access with, for lack of a better word, historical notes, for you know something that shows a historical context. I think that anytime you erase something, it becomes too easy to offer a counter narrative. I like knowing what was misogynist. I like knowing what was racist. I feel like it's the only way to kind of move forward. And I don't necessarily agree and listen, I think different contexts for different things. Like, I totally understand. You don't want to give your kids racist Dr. Seuss books. That makes a lot of sense. But it's interesting. A friend of mine whose mother's a teacher, she sees the values of those books of being like, for young kids, I don't want them to see that. But at a certain age, I do want those kids to see them because I want them to know this was our history. Something that seems so innocent could have harmful effects at the same time. And even those books can be used for educational purposes. And I, to me, I, that is personally how I sort of prefer the stuff to look. Like, I definitely understand that there are places where you should not have to deal with that, all that stuff. But I do think there is a place to be reminded that that stuff exists and it reminds that it exists in stuff that you love too. 
I think it should be put in context with notes. Younger kids should not be exposed without understanding the background behind it. And they might be too young for some of that stuff. I get that for sure. To me, if you erase it, you try to just cleanse it, make it never happen. I'm afraid that history could repeat itself. If we don't learn from how things went down a certain path and how people behaved, it could happen again. And again, with the book that I'm doing, the thing that drew me to this book was the fact that I was an adult and I hadn't heard about the Chinese Exclusion Act. I hadn't heard of the Immigration Act in 1924. I didn't know there was a span of almost 100 years where many Asian people couldn't come into the country. That history has a factor on things that are happening today. You know, we've seen all these anti-Asian hate crimes that are you know, skyrocketing across the country. And I think it's important for people to know that America has had a context of that happening. America has a history of sort of demonizing Asians and seeing Asians as disease and all that. So I totally understand anyone who's just kind of like, listen, there are people of a certain age who shouldn't be exposed to that until they're ready to be exposed to that. But I do think it can be dangerous to sort of wipe that record clean. I mean, because you know, I think we're seeing some of it right now. Well, your book does bring out some of that historical context for the story. And I know that in future issues, you're going to have some notes in the back that reference things in the book. And one of the things that happens in the first issue is Edison Hark. He has trouble getting in to the country. He's like waiting. And this is part of that Exclusion Act, that Immigration Exclusion Act right there. You address that. Yeah, yeah. So like the Chinese Exclusion Act started in 1882. And around 1910, they created an immigration station on Angel Island. And any immigrants coming in who crossed over the Atlantic, they would get processed through Ellis Island. Immigrants who came in through the Pacific would get processed in through Angel Island. And anyone whose immigration records were sort of seen as suspect, they would be detained there for a certain amount of time. And the way it worked was that in Ellis Island, you could get detained anywhere from a couple hours to days. In Angel Island, especially if you were Chinese, you can be detained anywhere from days to years. And so the maximum amount of time that someone could be detained there was two years. And I think the lowest was like a few weeks. And this was different. Europeans and Americans were detained for a much shorter amount of time. Asians were detained for longer than that. And the Chinese were detained for the longest of them all. And the interesting thing about Angel Island was it was actually an improvement on how things were. Originally, the people handling the immigration, they were very anti-Asian, very anti-Chinese. And so when Angel Island was created, it was adding more of a bureaucratic process that made it harder for the anti-Chinese sort of people who very much their slogan was America for Americans. They had less control over the people who immigrated into the country. Angel Island is something that is kind of forgotten now. Again, like I do believe different strokes for different folks, but remembering our history is important to Steve's context of where we're at now. And another topic that's brought up another uh, fact of history was something called the Paper Sons. Paper Sons is a tricky thing, but the idea is the 1905 fire in San Francisco erased a lot of the documentation on citizens sort of coming in. So as a result, immigration officials, when certain Chinese people came in, some of them would have fake documentation saying that they were citizens whose paperwork got burned in that fire. And the other thing that they could kind of do because of that, they could say, and not only that, I have three sons or three brothers who are in China. And the concept of paper sons was that that was in fact not true. What they did was they held a slot open and with a fake identity for these sons of theirs that other people would buy identification and pretend that they were those sons. And as they were their sons, they would kind of come in and say too, it's like, oh, and by the way, I have a brother or a son and kind of come in. So part of what Angel Island was sort of checking was to check that everyone was kind of who they said they were. But that was a challenging thing at the time. Immigration officials couldn't always tell the Chinese apart. For a while, one of the heads there thought because they couldn't tell apart, photographs weren't accurate enough. And so they started measuring their arms and their legs and their feet and their genitals. And they would compile these measurements and think that that is the best way to sort of tell who is who. So, you know, it, it was sort of a very sort of complicated process. And they would have these interviews where you would kind of come in and they would give you these extraordinary exams of how many windows are in your house? Where do you do your shopping? Okay, how many steps does it take to get from your front door to where you do your shopping? And they would answer all these questions and they would cross-reference these questions with witnesses that the immigrants, the travelers would offer. It was always easier when the witness was someone, either friend or family within the country, but it didn't have to be friends or family within the country. And if that testimony ever didn't align, the traveler would assume to be lying and would be deported back to China. So they were incredibly stringent with this. And these tests happened not just to Chinese immigrants, but Chinese American citizens, because one of the problems was that up until the mid 20th century, Chinese women living in the country would give birth at home. And so 
they would not have birth certificates saying that their Chinese American children were citizens. And then so on top of that, you know, they would have a bunch of tests for them and they would say like, well, if they dress kind of American, then they would be more lenient. Class made things more lenient. And on top of that, how good their English was would make things more lenient, which was tricky then because up until the middle of the century, middle of the 20th century, a lot of Chinese would live in urban centers like Chinatown where they wouldn't get a lot of interaction with non-Chinese people. So it was a very complicated process. To help you with your research, you brought in someone as a consultant to make sure everything was accurate that is referred to in the story. So you consulted Grant Din. Grant lives in Oakland. He's got so many different titles that it's like, it's just like, I want to do sort of a piece on Grant in the comic itself. I'm not going to do justice, but he's got a background in genealogy. He's done some work for Angel Island for history. If you look at his, uh, not MySpace, what are they called now? Uh, LinkedIn page. Oh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Yeah. It's (laughs) the other one I don't have. Um, (laughs) But if you looked at his LinkedIn, he's got all these like very long sort of titles of all the things he does over there. The short of it is that he has been wonderfully my historical consultant and kind of my last line of defense. So I do all of my research, put it into stories, and then sort of he reads it. And then he's kind of like, oh, no, well, this is actually this, and this is actually that, and that, and that, and that. And he's been an enormous sort of help through all of this. And besides all of that, in the story, there's certain language that's used and certain attitudes towards other people that's very much of the period. For example, one thing I noticed right away was that rather than saying someone was Asian, they were Oriental, which you don't hear now. You heard that back then. Yeah. So at the time, one of the things I found was interesting, right, is no one really said Chinese. They said Oriental. Mm. But in the 1930s, the word Asian didn't really exist. The closest thing there was was the word Asiatic. Asians didn't come in as a term until the 1960s. And it was a way, I think, inspired. And this I'm not sure about my history in this portion, but from what I understand, inspired by the civil rights movement. It was the idea of grouping different Asian groups together as solidarity and identity and political power. I could be wrong about that, though. My research did not extend that far. But that said, though, I do know that Asians was not a term in the 1930s. In the new text piece at the end of issue one, I talk about that a little, about how, you know, at the time, Chinese was considered Oriental. There wasn't a word such as the Asian. And when Asians referred to Caucasians, they didn't call them white people. They called them Americans. That was just the vernacular of the time. Another thing about the story is the partner of Edison Hark, he is O'Malley, and they're both working in the Chinatown district. O'Malley, who isn't technically a partner, Hark is just kind of helping O'Malley. Hark is looking for a girl, and O'Malley, for a fee, is giving him a lead. So they're working together sort of when we meet them. The way that O'Malley treats people in Chinatown, he's pretty racist, he's pretty brutal with them. Since Edison is with him, they don't trust him. They don't believe that he's a detective. And when they find out that he is, you're not honest, you're not one of us. You betrayed your race, your culture, your people. Well, so much of Edison Hark is inspired by the inspiration for Charlie Chan, which is Changaparna. Changaparna was a detective in Hawaii, I want to say in the early 20th century. And so much of Hark was inspired by him. He was, in fact, the first Chinese detective in America, even though not in mainland uh, America. And he was used pretty much against other Chinese people. He would help round up, at the time, Chinese who had leprosy so that they could be sent off to Molokai. He went into gambling dens and opium dens because the Chinese in those places and running those places didn't have any concept of a Chinese cop. And so he would kind of come in and then go out and be able to tell the cops, like, okay, here are the guys you're looking for. These are the exits and all that kind of stuff. So he was very much used Mm. uh, against sort of the Chinese people at that time. And again... It was taking all that sort of stuff and looking at it through the lens of racial understanding that we have now of saying like, oh, wow, you do that. You're kind of an Uncle Tom. And like, what does that mean? And what does that do to your sense of identity? You know, similarly, O'Malley is part of the Chinatown squad. And I try really hard to sort of stick to the facts of what they had offered about Chinatown and Chinatown squad and the Chinese experience. But I also try to extrapolate from the facts. And from what I can tell, there's not a lot written about the Chinatown squad in the 1930s. But the, one of the things that is written is the fact that the people and the cops got along in the 1930s. And that's a little something that I personally felt they need to call shenanigans on because the Chinatown squad up to the 30, 40 years previous within the same generation of police officers, well, the tongs were such a problem, the squad were known to carry axes and they would just like chop down the doors in Chinatown in order to get the Tong members. So to me to say like, oh, within 30, 40 years, everything was good when the cops were just taking axes to your doors with everything we've learned now about police reform and how long it takes for a time before Miranda writes, I don't know if I quite buy that. And so all the characters in the cops especially kind of have a historical precedent. 
And also the folks in Chinatown, they were looking for acceptance and integration into American society. So if anything happened that brought any kind of attention to them or shame to them or trouble, that made them very upset. They did not want to be seen in that light. And it's funny, like, even today, that's still a thing. You know, there are certain tongs that were sort of more violent and certain tongs that I don't want to be reminded of that because that particular tongs worked so hard to not be considered violent hatchet men and, and all that kind of stuff. So that's still sort of a thing now. And especially at the time, you know, but in 1936, especially Chinatown was on the cusp of sort of being accepted. There was such a thing called the chop suey circuit, which were Chinatown uh, night and supper clubs where they would have sort of Chinese people doing cabaret act. And we get it a little bit in the series as well. And white Americans were coming to those clubs and spending money in those clubs. And that was seen as a positive. But at the same time, I think in 1935, the Chinatown squad closed down Chinatown, prohibited people from entering and closing because they feared that there was a, a Tong presence coming. So it was something that could sort of change at a dime at the time. In the 1930s, it was a tightrope, I feel like, that was walked at the time. The Chinese culture, the Asian culture is very interesting. And it really hasn't changed in some ways, because just as in this story. They want to be integrated. They don't want to have any problems. It really stands not only with the family, don't shame the family, don't disgrace the family. And we all think that now, all of us, but even the culture, because I have even heard in the past several years, people I know, their child will be working someplace and they're going to go take an exam. And another older Asian would say, don't shame us. It's interesting. Like, it's, I think it's a difference between the Eastern and Western culture. Western culture is certainly more individualistic and the Eastern mm -hmm. culture is more community based. And so there is a little more sense of like, you know, you're representing more than just you, which is very common. And it's one of the challenges of being Asian American, but so many immigrants, I feel like, feel this, where it's two cultures that are kind of colliding against one another and they seem to kind of be at odds. Western culture is about the individual, Eastern culture is about the community. And I think for Asian Americans, it's about, OK, well, where do I stand? How do I straddle those two camps? What's left that's me? You know, some people won't like this, but I think that's one of the reasons why in this country we had so much difficulty and still have difficulty with getting people to wear a mask. Yeah. Whereas over in Asia, well, a lot of times they wear it all the time because of the pollution, yeah. but they have no problem complying because they're thinking more cultural, community-based. Where here there's so much individuality. Yes. You don't see that acceptance. It's really true. And not only that, there is sort of that, you know, the idea of American exceptionalism, this idea that if we just want something hard enough and go after something hard enough, then nothing can get in our way. Nothing will stand in our way. And that turned out to be a problem with the pandemic and with the mass mandates that people just think like, no, 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 I am the exception to the rule. Like I can figure out a way to beat this or it's not going to affect me. And so, yeah, you are seeing sort of a lot of that stuff. There's a lot of stuff that, like you say, hasn't changed. One of the things that I just recently sort of realized after working on the book is that, you know, and it comes from sort of all these anti-Asian hate crimes kind of happening around the country, where one of the things I sort of realized is that we're still not really talking about blue collar working class Asians. I mean, that was something that takes place in the book about the people living in Chinatown, but we don't see them in movies or TV shows. If you see them in a TV show, it's usually on like a law and order and they're answering a question before a detective goes to sort of the next place, but they are still kind of invisible. While I was working on it, I was very deep into the material in the 1930s. There is this pressure to be accurate to the time and yet still say something about today. And I find myself a lot wondering, in a weird way, finding out God, in some ways, it's almost too easy. In some ways, these things haven't changed at all. Right. Uh, it's one thing I noticed as I was reading this, which is why it's great to have this story coming out. Why the title The Good Asian? The Good Asian is a reference to the model minority myth, the fact that Asians are the good minority. To me, it begs the question of, if you're going to say The Good Asian, well, what is a good Asian? Does a good Asian have responsibility to his family over himself? Does he have responsibility to himself over his family? Does he have responsibility to his community? For Hark, well, Hark is a quote-unquote good Asian because he's upholding the American law. But at the same time, he's upholding the American law at the expense of the rights of other Chinese people of the time. So is he good? Is he bad? What is the best way for Hark, but also for Asians in general, whatever privilege they have, what is the best way for them to use it? As I talked about before, sometimes East meets West can feel like such a conflict. If you're a quote-unquote good Asian, where do you land in the center of that conflict. And so to me, there are all those questions surrounding racial identity and certainly what does it take to sort of be good or bad and a good immigrant or a bad immigrant in that sense. And it's another reason why a detective story made so much sense to deal with these themes since a detective is kind of a professional asker of questions. Yeah, not only is he trying to solve a mystery, but he's also straddled between two cultures that are clashing with each other and he's got to try to satisfy both 
it's almost like one excludes the other in some cases when you try to do that. And that is sort of the perennial question. I think it's a question for Asian American identity. In the story, it takes all that and dramatizes it and makes it literal in the sense of, well, Edison Hark is someone who was adopted and raised by a rich white family after his mother died. His mother, who was their housekeeper, died. And so he feels privilege. And so he feels this desire to give back to the people who didn't have the privilege that he has. But one of the things, the questions he's asked is like, well, well, how do I do that? For him, it was being a cop and only to find that he was being weaponized against his own community. When we meet him, he is at that place where he just feels like change is impossible and things will never get better. We see him go through the course of the book is kind of re-examining his relationship with his family, with his community, with his people, and try to define his sense of self that is purely himself as much as anyone can apart from any of those other factors. This series is nine issues long, which is an odd number. I was wondering why you picked nine. Honestly, it was, I had the story laid out. It was the least amount of issues to tell the story I wanted to tell. I think for me, I did this with Infidel as well. Like, When I wrote Infidel, I honestly didn't know if I'd ever write another comic after that, just in the sense that these things are expensive. And so like, I had no idea if anyone was going to buy it. And the way I looked at it was kind of like, when you go to Vegas, it's just like, this is the money I have to lose. And we're just going to keep gambling until all that money's gone. And so when I did Infidel, I was like, you know, I had this much, I don't have any more money than this. So I have enough to make this book. I don't really have enough to make more, like to the point where I think very late in the process, I realized like, oh, wait. I made all my calculations as if this book wasn't going to sell a single copy, but hopefully it'll sell some copies. If it sells like half as much as it costs to make it, I can make two books now. Like I could do a second book. But like at the time, it was all about just like trying to get as much resources together so I could get Infidel made, that book made the way it deserved to be made. And so there's a little bit of that with The Good Asian as well. Like I have ideas for what sequels could look like, but For me, it's a little bit of like, okay, but if this is the only book that comes out, what would I regret? You know, not just sort of the mystery, but all the themes and all the things with the characters. What would I regret not getting the chance to talk about? And so the story is also sort of part of that. And Nine Issues was the least amount of space to kind of do that. And and who knows, like, the fingers crossed, I don't end up like extending it an issue because I calculated wrong. But it really was just like, this is the story I have to tell. And, you know, this is the, what is the most compressed way to tell it? I've mentioned on the show before a couple of times that I used to train in the martial arts and I was Mm -hmm. taught, and it was a traditional school, very traditional, no frills. It was train, train, train. That was it. And you learned about the Asian culture. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I was taught was that the number nine means completion. It's the end. So I was wondering if you stumbled on that. I was like, oh, very nice. You can can run with that. Run with it now. I wish I thought that. (laughs) I I, I, I was that thorough with things. I really do. That's a great answer. That should be my answer going forward. And that's what I expanded my questions Kicking back with the creator, my fun questions for my guests that made it nine. So it's the end of the interview. So oh, you asked that nine. Yeah. So great job with making it nine issues. Thank you. <laughs> very Thanks. smart. Very smart. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. <laughs> but it's a really good story. And I love a uh, crime noir. And looking at this now through this new lens as an Asian noir, possibly a new genre that you're starting. Hopefully. I, listen, I would like to see more genre work tackle Asian American history issues and themes that really pertain to or towards Asian Americans, that would be awesome. Whether in the noir genre or not, we've come up with a term, and I credit where credit due, Ed Brubaker came up with the term Chinatown noir, and I've been kind of running with it ever since. But I do think that it, it encapsulates a lot of the stuff that we hope to hit in the book. Well, now that comics and books, television are starting to reflect more of what society looks like than just being a white male dominated society, hopefully as that continues to proliferate and grow, then we'll see stories that go back to the past and look at culture rather than just looking ahead, which is great. Let's go back and see what happened then. Let's tell stories from back then as well and include everyone. Yeah. And again, for me, the desire is always by looking at the past, we get a little bit more context for why the present is what it is. Please tell me about the team on the book, who you're working with and what each person is contributing. My artist is Alexander Tefenki. He is fantastic. He was born in Africa, Vietnamese descent and raised in France. When I met him, he was living in Vietnam. Uh, He's now living in France with his family again. And he's fantastic. His art is everything I would have wanted from it. Like I think when we started working on the book, we're just like, what does an Asian Darwin cook look like? And that doesn't do Alex's art enough justice because Alex on the one hand is so clean with his line, but yet on the other hand, so emotive. He's one of those amazing artists. His acting is so great. His characters can actually 
express two emotions at once in the same way that like actual actors can. So he's just so fantastic. And I am so grateful to work with him. We found out in this book that he really loves and is really good at drawing action. So like he does that really well. He's just been one of those people that I could just throw everything at and he'll just come back with something that just looks amazing. So Alex has been wonderful. Uh, Lee Lowridge, the colorist. I've known Lee, I think my very first time I went out for drinks in comics as a comic book professional, uh, Lee Lowridge was the one who invited me out. And so I've known Lee for ages and his colors are amazing. The wonderful thing about Lee, he's so good at adding atmosphere. So like Alex can be a hard person to color and he can be a hard person to color because everything is on the page. When he gives you his black and white files, everything is there. A lot of times it can be hard for a colorist a colors can try to color that stuff and then just make it too busy and just make it look garish. And so you need a certain amount of restraint to sort of do that. And then there are other colors who try to that, but then don't ultimately add anything. Lee add, always adds something. He always magnifies the atmosphere. And that's why he's so great on like, and he's done a bunch of noir stuff through his career. And, but that's one of the reasons why he's so good at it is that he can take black and white art that's all completed completely there and just add extra atmosphere to it and magnify the atmospheres there. He's also a fantastic storyteller. He's one of those colorists. You get a lot of colorists who they do a page and they're done and they never look back. And you're just kind of like, eh, can you change this stuff? And there's like, no, which is fine. It can be a way to work. But for a book like this, because it is a mystery, because it's about a detective putting clues together, sometimes we do kind of have to like, oh, this needs to be this because in another issue, we're going to pay off on this and this. And so he's so good about taking notes, but also finding a way to still make the thing look gorgeous sort of despite the notes. And he has these color choices that are just so bold and surprising at the same time. So he's great. Jeff Powell was my letter and designer on Infidel. And Jeff also has this sort of very clean design sense that I love because I feel like sometimes modern comics can fall under the trap of being overly designed and overly complicated and too visually busy. You know, he's also a fantastic letterer. Once every project, I feel like there's one special effect that he nails so well. I actually change my dialogue so that people will pay more attention to the sound effect because I love how the sound effect looks so much. So Jeff's amazing. Dave Johnson, who does our covers, I mean, Dave is just like, he did the covers for 100 Bullets. The hardest I've ever laughed at San Diego Comic-Con was probably a joke that Dave Johnson told me. And so he's a friend that goes back a ways, but he's also, because 100 Bullets, he's so like, in my mind, the crime comics cover person. And so the idea of taking someone like that, in a way, it's probably the closest as a comics person I can get to saying, hey, Saul Bass, like, can you redesign these iconic covers with some Asian influences, uh, Asian elements too? So that's great. And But then also on the variant side, Sana Takeda, who does Monstrous, does all our variants, and she's amazing. I'm such a huge fan of that book. And what we're trying to do is with the variant for every issue, there are so many wonderful Asian and Asian American artists working in comics and doing covers that the variance for me is to work with all those Asian and Asian American artists that I love that I've never had a chance to work with. And so we'll do a different one for every book. And then there's Will Dennis, who is one of my best friends in comics. He gave me my first Chandler novel. He was like one of my teachers and mentors at Vertigo. And there's no version of this book I could imagine without him. Like there's a reason why he edits the best talent and edits all of Image's top selling books. And so I'm just so grateful that he's on here with me. That's a really solid team. Lee's colors look fantastic. Would there be a point where you could say, okay, a second printing or something, a special printing, just in black and white, like an old noir? You know, I've been thinking about that. I've been thinking about, uh, the answer is, I don't know. I mean, I've been thinking about like what black and white scenes look like, but I don't know. Lee is so good at what he does. It's hard. When you look at those finished pages, it's hard. They're so finished. They're so complete. It's hard to imagine. Like, what's the best way to do that? I mean, maybe like a magazine size like they did with Criminal. Maybe that might be yeah. the way to go. There are definitely things I've been thinking about. And again, Lee just does such I good know. work. You don't want to leave it's anybody hard out to... now. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Folks should order this. You said coming out in May. Yeah, it's coming out in May. Like I said, it's a genre that we're calling Chinatown Noir. It's sort of a reexamination of noir, I suppose, from the perspective of a Chinese-American detective featuring the first generation of Americans to have grown up under the shadow of an immigration ban, the Chinese. And it's hopefully all the fun stuff that you get out of noir and mysteries. And the thing I'm really trying to do is, for me, Infidel was taking sort of a horror movie and using the language of comics to sort of experience a horror movie as a comic. And for me, The Good Asian is those old Chandler novels and Hammett novels and McDonald novels trying to use the vocabulary of comics to get everything I feel when I'm reading those books and experience it as a comic. So that's hopefully one of the things we'll try to do in the course of the book. All right. I have some of those fun questions to ask all my guests that you've not had the chance yet to answer. There's just a okay. few of them, so just have fun. What is your guilty pleasure? You know, I 
no, you know what? I think what my guilty pleasure is late night talk show interviews. That is now my new guilty pleasure. But pandemic, I bubbled with my mother. And so we live together now, which is a trip. And so I don't watch as much TV as I used to. All the TV we now we watch together, I don't have as much guilty pleasures on television. So my guilty pleasures are now more YouTube clips. And I find myself watching through this pandemic a lot of talk show interviews. And they're all a lot of them done through uh, Skype. But not just that. Like some of them are old talk show interviews. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, like, like, what like, are you watching? I have just random stuff. Like whatever's on. I've always loved Craig Ferguson. Like, mm-hmm. and he's like such a great interviewer. So like, I'll pop on an old Craig Ferguson interview occasionally. But yeah, but not necessarily all like the Zoom sort of stuff. But like a couple of years ago, where people could still come. Oh, into okay. Studio. Yeah, yeah. I saw Craig twice. Did into you? Stand up in Wilmington, Delaware, of all places. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. He feels he like he great. might be the most charming man in the world. Uh, as long as you keep the spotlight on him. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> no, no I, I thought it was an act at first. He was moving along the stage and the spotlight didn't stay with him. And he would just go, oh. you know, and he started like giving the guy a hard time. Uh-huh. And we were all kind of sitting there going, eh, eh, like a little uncomfortable. Like, I, I think he was really mad if he was acting. Well, it was that's really, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Otherwise, he's hilarious. But at that one moment, we saw him kind of, kind of get really upset. <laughs> Because he was pacing. Wow. He was pacing when he was talking. Yeah, yeah, so the yeah. guy's like trying to keep up with the spotlight. There's one single wow. spotlight. Yeah, yeah. That's funny. I'm sure he's a great guy. <laughs> <laughs> for you, have there been or what is probably for you the biggest missed opportunity? So I will start by saying that it's hard for me to think that way. And I know this is such a like, it sounds like such a political can't answer. It's hard to think that way just because it sounds so trite, but everything happens for a reason. And so like all the jobs I never got, all the things that didn't happen, enough time would come by that I'll be like, thank God I never got that job. Thank God I never dated that person. Thank God I never, it's like all that sort of stuff. But so the only thing that comes to mind is I'm very good friends with Mark Doyle, who was the head of Vertigo for a while, the head of DC Black Label and Mark has kids. And so we went out for drinks and he was just like, listen, I'm so sorry I had to cancel last time, but I, I forgot I had plans to play Dungeons and Dragons. And it was just like, you who canceled on me for d and like, you don't understand when you're a parent, anything you can do with other people that doesn't wake up your kids is like something you just have to like clutch <laughs> onto. So I had people coming over and the kids were going to be asleep. And so I was like, all right, fine, fine, no, no problem. And so as we were talking, he's like, you know, would it be crazy if we just saw a movie right now? If we just went and saw a movie? It's like, dude, I see movies all the time. Like, if you want to see a movie, we can see a movie. But for him, as a parent, the spontaneity of just at a second's notice seeing a movie was like this big sort of thing. And so we were caught between like, what should we watch? And I think it was down to Atomic Blonde. And oh, crap. I forgot the movie we actually ended up seeing. It was a Sundance movie about a overweight white female rapper, and I don't remember what it's called anymore. But it came down to those two movies, and we weren't sure which movie we were going to see. So it was like, let's just go to the Arclight, and whatever movie is the first one playing, we'll go see that. It's like, okay, great. So we go, and the first movie playing is this movie from Sundance, and we have some time. So it's like, hey, you want to go to the bar and get some drinks? And we're going to the bar, and while I'm at the bar, I hear this man hitting on this woman. And he's hitting on this woman, and I don't even look at him, and I think, I know that voice. And without even looking at him, I'm thinking, that's Quentin Tarantino's voice. <laughs> and it was Quentin Tarantino hitting on this woman at the bar. And so me and Mark are sitting there, we're talking, and we haven't seen each other like in months. But we're having the hardest time catching up because all we can do is eavesdrop on Quentin Tarantino's conversation. And then all of a sudden, someone comes up to him, and they start talking about, he, Quentin Tarantino talks about, like, this is the best Dolly shot of all time. Like, the, I've never seen a Dolly shot this good. But like, what is this? Dolly? And it was about Atomic Blonde. Uh-huh. And... Um, the other thing I should say is the reason why I started eavesdropping on this conversation in the first place is this guy who was hitting on this girl, Quentin Tarantino, who was in the car, he was mentioning this movie that we were just about to go see. So at first it was just like, oh, wow, he's talking about that movie we're going to go see. And two, it's like, oh, it's Quentin Tarantino talking about this movie we're going to see. So anyway, <laughs> now he's talking about Atomic Blonde. And, you know, eventually it's time to go see our movie and we go see our movie. You know, we leave that movie. It's like, I can't believe, like, we were standing behind Quentin Tarantino this whole time. And I woke up the next morning and was like, oh, my God. I could have turned around and asked Quentin Tarantino which movie we should see. And I could say (laughs) that Quentin Tarantino recommended this movie to me. Mm -hmm. And that is probably the thing that pops to mind when I think of the biggest lost opportunity is not asking Quentin Tarantino which of the two movies that he both clearly liked (laughs) that I see in 15 minutes. Well, going to have those drinks turn out to probably better than the movie. How entertaining is that? (laughs) Yeah, we still talk about that. We still talk about that. Mark will also like remind me too. It's like, and see, whatever would have happened if I didn't cancel on you for Dungeons and Dragons. I'm just like, all right, yeah. all right. 
Wow. So yeah, no, no, no. That that, that was uh, yeah, yeah. That, that that was a big LA moment for us. Wow, that's a great one. And for you, when did you take a risk? I'm sure you take a lot, you know, books, movies, and stuff. And when can you say I took a risk? When it's hard. I feel like I could be wrong about this. I feel like I take a lot of risks in my professional life and not a lot of risks and not enough risks, I think, in my personal life. Creatively, I take risks all the time. I Certainly my biggest risk I feel like I took was I used to be DC Comics TV. I used to oversee their TV department. I was like Chef John's right hand when it comes to television during that time. And I pretty much quit to write full time. And I didn't have a job lined up. I didn't have anything lined up. I proceeded not to do anything for about two years. But I think that was probably sort of, I don't know if it's a bigger risk, but that when I think about risk, that's the one that sort of comes to mind. It was just kind of leaving. It was a very cushy job. It was a very nice job. I think a lot of people assumed I was fired because it was so cushy and nice. But leaving that job to kind of focus on my own writing was certainly, if I think about sort of one of the bigger, riskier things, I'm sure that probably is up there. To walk away from a job, a good one, without anything yeah. lined up, I would be anxious. I'd be re- I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, all the above. I did, uh, I did all that sort of stuff. I knew this is what I wanted to do, and so it just felt like the right time. But yeah, but I think at the time it was just like, oh, this feels like a big step. Wow. How did you get through that day by day without that certainty? Like, you have any tips for people? That are- <laughs> uh, honestly, for me, it was the work. It was the mm. work. It was okay. I got to finish this script. Got to finish this story. And it's a weird thing because I think the anxiety can kind of like skew your creative process a little bit. I'm grateful for all the jobs I didn't get during that time because I think if I had gotten the jobs I thought I wanted, it would have taken me down a career path that I wouldn't have been as happy as I am now. But I think if I had any advice that I could go back in time to give myself was that I definitely had a period where I feel like I made a bunch of the mistakes I used to tell freelancers not to make. There's a little bit when you're starting off being a writer where you want someone to kind of bless you and say, like, you're a writer now. And so, like, if you sign with this management company, that means I'm a writer. If I do this, that means you're a writer. And the truth is, of course, it's that's not the case. You just kind of have to keep sort of doing it. And I think for me, like, because I'd worked sort of a nine to five for so long, I didn't really know what I wanted. And it almost felt like I was waiting And I think it's part of it too. I think part of it was waiting for someone to tell me I was a writer. And part of telling me I was a writer is it was them sort of saying, and now it's time for you to do this. And the truth of it, which is a little bit harder, it takes a little bit more soul searching, is the fact that you don't have to convince yourself that you're a writer if you know what you want to do. For me at that time, I knew I wanted to write and I didn't really realize, well, what did I want to write? I would have been just grateful to have a job writing. And that's one of the reasons I say, I'm so grateful I didn't get the jobs I thought I wanted because if I did... I would have just been a company man writing and as opposed to what I learned in the interim, which is just like, oh, what do you want to write? And what are jobs that you were willing to turn down because you want to write what you want to write? Because there is the misnomer that the further along you get in your career, it'll get easier to take chances. And that's actually not true. The easiest time to take a chance is when you're starting off. And from there, you will build the muscles to take chances throughout the course of your career. It's really easy to take your chance when you have no one looking over your shoulder and putting pressure on you to do something. And so I thank God for all the jobs I didn't get because it gave me the time to realize, look, these are the things like a book like The Good Asian is something I really want to do. I won't take other work because I want to work on The Good Asian. And so those are the lessons that I kind of learned along the way that, you know, I'm really, again, I'm glad for all the jobs I didn't get because I clearly needed to learn those lessons. With this being your sophomore effort, The Good Asian, yeah. do you feel more comfortable now writing comics? Do you feel like you'll come back and do another one after this at some point if you want to fit it in with your other work? Like you say, schedule some time yeah. and say, I'm going to do the third one now when the time's right. The good news is Infidel did well enough, and hopefully The Good Asian won't do bad enough to reverse this, but Infidel did well enough that it made me realize like, oh – other people want me to do comics, you know, so I think I can find a way. There is a demand for it so that I can do it. Again, hopefully Good Asian doesn't reverse all that goodwill. But so, yes, yeah, so I definitely kind of want to still keep writing comics as much as I can. Uh, I juggle between TV and comics work, and so I'm always trying to write more comics. Well, keeping a nice, diverse job schedule is a great idea, you know, for some security. You don't put all your eggs in one basket ever because <laughs> exactly. things change. Diversified portfolio yes. is something everyone <laughs> recommend. The Good Asian, coming in May. Pornsec, thank you so much for being on Creator Talks. Thank you. Okay, folks, coming up in two weeks, Alan Calsill. Alan joins me from the UK to speak about his latest work, The Way of the Warrior. In this hardcover reference guide, discover fighting styles, training techniques, and secret disciplines of Marvel's mightiest martial artists and hand-to-hand combatants. 
from disciplines of Eastern combat tactics and mixed martial arts to superpowered street fighters and deadly weapons masters, this book pulls no punches in revealing Marvel's Ultimate Warriors. That is quoted directly from Diamond Previews, which listed it in its March 21 catalog as a featured item. However, the book is just a tiny portion of our conversation because Alan was a comic book retailer, then he became an award-winning writer and editor for Marvel and Panini Publishing, he wrote a Spider-Man strip, and several other magazines and guides, including DC Comics Superhero Collection, Cartoon Network Magazine, and DC Comics Year by Year, which has been updated through 2019. But wait, there's more. Alan is also a martial artist, so we talk quite a bit about that, and he's also a podcaster, the host of Last Geek in Space. So please join me for that interview in two weeks on Thursday. And now it's time for Kickstarter Corner, where I update you on current Kickstarter campaigns by previous guests. First is Matt Mayer Lowry. He has a Kickstarter running for a sci-fi anthology series in the tradition of 2080 Black Mirror and Twilight Zone called Thoughtscape Comics No. 1, and that is running through May 3rd. Samuel George London, I've been on his show and he will be on mine in the future, has a Kickstarter for Milford Green Saga, which runs through May 5th. And I'll have two others to announce after my next interview. In the meantime, you may follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and or Instagram at Creator Talks Pod. That's at Creator Talks Pod. You can contact me directly via email, creatortalks at gmail.com. That is creatortalks at gmail.com. And if you haven't yet, there's no time like the present to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts and spread the word to others who like comic books and to learn more about the creators behind them. And that's all for now. Thank you so much for listening to the show. For Creator Talks, this has been your host, Christopher Calloway. Until next time.